All right, Nightmare Success listeners, we're back. And man, am I excited about the guest I have today. Um, you know, this this program is all about, you know, what happens when your worst fear becomes your reality. How do you adapt, survive, overcome, set yourself free? Well, Seth Williams, if you go to Wikipedia, this guy has quite the uh, Wikipedia page. But uh, I think, and I was thinking back all the different interviews that's that's happened here the last year and a half. And Seth is the first guest that I've had that has run the full spectrum of the criminal justice system. I can't wait to get in and, and talk to him a little bit about that. Um, he, he was a graduate of uh, Georgetown Law School. He made a name for himself with a stellar career in the Philadelphia District Attorney's Office. He became the first black elected district attorney in Philly, served two terms, was running for a third. And he really became a darling of the party of discussion of bigger state offices and national offices. And then a nightmare began and uh, he had an investigation. It was all around undisclosed gifts and it just became a, a nasty mess. But, you know, Seth mm-hmm. is one of the few people that I've had on here because 97% of us, when we get indicted, we plea out. And uh, Seth went to trial and on the eighth day, uh, they came to a plea agreement was reached and uh, he ended up getting a five-year uh, federal prison sentence. Seth is doing incredible things now using his experience, his intellect to help others in the whole reentry process of returning right. home. And, and I can't wait to talk to him about that too. Before we get into that, I want to recognize our sponsor for the show, Auto Plaza Direct. You know, who likes spending a couple of weekends walking lots, looking for a car? Then you spend like four or five hours in the dealership to buy a car. It's kind of like a trip to the dentist. Well, there's a better way. Take away all the pain and hassle of getting a car. It's called Auto Plaza Direct. They are your personal car concierge. Just tell them the car you want, what you can pay, and they'll go find that car for you. They'll negotiate your best price, and they'll deliver that car to you. They also offer you warranties and financing. It's full service. Go to autoplazadirect.com to get started with your personal car concierge. The new hassle-free way, the car buying experience you deserve, Auto Plaza Direct. Tell them Brent from Nightmare Success sent you. Seth Williams, welcome in, my man. How are you doing today? Can you hear me? Did I lose you, Seth? Seth, your, sk- your screen's frozen. Can you hear me now? I can hear can you. you. Hear me now? I got you. All right. I got you. I got you. Okay. All right. Yeah, you Here froze you for a little while. Okay. We were both frozen. That's a good way to start the program right there. We both froze up, but we're back. Seth, welcome. <laughs> welcome aboard. How Thank are you, you, man? Doing very well. So, Seth, you have um, you have an incredible story. And, and uh, I want to give a, a shout out to Jeff Grant because he, he was on the show here. Um, uh, two or three episodes ago, and we were talking back and forth. And he, he obviously, uh, Jeff knows a lot of people with with what he does in his world. And he said, "Man, you, you got to if you can get a hold of Seth." And he gave me your contact, and so we connected, and uh, here we are. Yeah. So and so again, it's great that you mentioned you know Jeff Grant, and yeah. that um, yes, I participate. And I used to participate every week, but I still frequently participate in his Monday evening um, Zoom white meetings. White collar support group, yeah. White collar support group for men and women from all across the country that have had their own nightmare come to reality. Yes. Um, but it's a way for us to help each other. Yeah. And exactly. um, so, you know, hopefully we'll get into that. But yes, Jeff has been a tremendous resource to a lot of us. Yeah. Um, to talk about and to deal with, because for the most part, those of us that have been prosecuted, uh, specifically white collar, what they refer, what we refer to as white collar crimes, mm-hmm. um, you know, don't have a network of people to talk to. Yeah, I feel like you're on an island. Yeah. So when I prosecuted, you know, I was an assistant district attorney for ten and a half years. Yeah. I also was a criminal defense attorney. I was an Army JAG officer where I prosecuted and defended people. But frequently, the people that I prosecuted or the people that I defended um, 
had made a conscious decision to get into whatever the criminal endeavor they were in, but they knew people that had also made that decision or they yeah. were working with other people, um, right or wrong, right? No judgment necessarily, but they had friends that told them what to expect. If something goes bad and you do end up in state prison or federal prison or county, they, so they kind of knew what to expect. And there was a network of people that if they did go to prison, right? When you watch the mafia movies, they go to prison. They know how to take care of the person's family while they're yeah. gone. Yeah. Right. Well, it's the exact opposite for white collar criminals. Yes. And that people that, you know, uh, depended upon you or used you or, you know, um, when you become under investigation or you get convicted, all of those people give you the Heisman. Yeah. Right. They don't want to be anywhere near you. Right. Um, people don't come to your assistance for the most part. Now, there, there are, of course, there are some, you know, um, people that stand out that do that are true friends, maybe. But for the most part, people that you might have considered your uh, associates, colleagues, um, all hide. So one of the great things about the um, white collar, uh, the progressive prison ministry and the support group is just to have people to talk to because I think what's fundamental to your the title of your show, right? Um, and to your listeners. Yeah. What I found when I lost everything, and I know we'll get into that, but you know, I lost my reputation, I lost my law license, I lost my pension, I lost yeah. my house, I lost my military career, um, time with loved ones. Um, I lost all of those things, um, but it was in losing all of those things that I really learned much more than I ever had even exposed to. I learned a, a sense of resiliency, but again, what I believe is a great part of your podcast and what is a great reason to have it. That we may be comfortable, but that we may a lot of my fear when I was under investigation was just the unknown. I didn't know what to expect. I had no one to talk to. Right. Um, and so being able to talk to other people or share my own personal experience, hopefully there'll be someone that um, will listen and find some sense of solace, hope, um, of possible resources to turn to um, so that they can thrive. Well, let's do this because I think Seth, you've got an interesting uh, background from the beginning. Can you kind of walk us back a little bit about, you know, Seth Williams growing up as a kid? Sure. And you mentioned earlier that I had a great Wikipedia. Well, a lot of things are on Wikipedia. I mean, anybody can go on there, and a and lot of no. <laughs> things, a lot of things about my life were removed. Yeah. It used to talk about my military career and. All of that was erased. I don't know by whom. Right. So, yeah, but anyway, I don't know how that works. I, I don't. I don't. I don't know how Wikipedia works, but I do know that people can add and and uh, delete. And I'm not. I'm not sure how either one of those work. Right. So, um, again, my name is Seth, and uh, I was born January the second, 1967, and uh, I was given up for adoption at birth. And uh, I, I lived in an orphanage and foster care. Um, but God had a great plan for me. And I was adopted by a wonderful family who lived in Philadelphia. My father's name was Rufus O. Williams. And uh, he was a school teacher. Um, every night he took a nap. He made sure I did my homework. We had dinner together. Then he went to his second job every evening from 6 p.m. to 10 p.m., where he worked at a recreation center in our neighborhood, wow. coaching basketball, playing table tennis with kids, playing chess, teaching them how to play checkers, showing movies on Monday nights. And uh, every summer, he was the director of a day camp um, uh, here in Philadelphia. So his entire life was dedicated to um, improving the quality of life for kids and their families and providing opportunity. 
And I, I learned much later, I would tell people that despite being the district attorney, I know that my father did much more than I'll ever do to prevent crime. Mm. Uh, but my father was the son of an AME minister and my father didn't drink, he didn't smoke, he didn't curse. Um, he was a student at Penn State when World War II, uh, when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor and he enlisted the next day. And um, after graduating from Penn State and earning his master's also in education there, he then moved to Houston, Texas to help a friend start the art department mm. at a college that was known as the Texas Southern College for Negroes. It's now Texas Southern University. Yeah, so I said no Texas Southern, yeah. Yeah, and he had a great, he said he had a 1948 Hudson convertible that was green with red leather interior and uh, helped, he caught the attention of a young lady who was a, a freshman and uh, so he, she was 18 and he was 28. I told you my father didn't drink, smoke, or curse, but he found himself a little Creole girl from Galveston, Texas that did all three of those things well and often. <laughs> all right. Opposites right? attract, right? Yeah, opposites <laughs> attract. And uh, so uh, my, my mother was Catholic and my father converted to Catholicism when they got married and they moved back to his hometown of Philadelphia. And I told you my father was a school teacher. He worked at a rec center and he taught, he ran a day camp in the summers. My mother was the executive secretary to the commanding officer at the Philadelphia Naval Shipyard. Wow. Okay. And she was uh, all of five foot tall. But she would tell you that there was a different commanding officer at the Navy Yard every three years. Right? Every three years, a new captain or admiral would be a named the commanding officer. But she said, through it all, she was in charge. <laughs> <laughs> of course which taught she was. Me a lot, which, which taught <laughs> me a lot about how to deal with support staff and people that actually make things happen and to treat sure. everyone with respect. But I was given up for adoption at birth and my parents, um, I was their only child. I was their only extravagance. So they um, saved their money and put me in the best schools that they could. I attended a private Quaker school in Philadelphia, right? So I told you I was the son of a, a man who converted from being an AME yeah. to a Catholic. So I went to Catholic church every Sunday, but I went to Quaker school where about 70% of my classmates were Jewish. Wow. So I, I was exposed to a lot and learned how to appreciate our differences and find similarities between people and to respect um, however yeah, I learned they learned a lot with that. Did you learn, um, Seth, early on that you were adopted, or how did, how does that work with somebody who's That's a great, adopted? It's a great question. So my mother was very was a Creole, so her parents were um, the, the the result of uh, what in the South then was referred to as the miscegenation of the French slave owners and their property. Mm -hmm. So they're very light skinned. Um, uh, African Americans are referred to as Creole, and they spoke a the language Creole, which is like a mm -hmm. broken French. Uh, my father, uh, Rufus Williams, my mother's name was Imelda Williams, Imelda Broussard. Her maiden name was Broussard, which is a Creole name, which is as familiar as Smith down Louisiana and East Texas. Well, there, and, yeah, uh, and there are Broussard. No, there's not. I was thinking there. There, I know somebody Broussard that lived around in that area that had yeah, well, yeah. You can't throw a stone without hitting a Broussard in uh, <laughs> southwestern Louisiana and New Orleans. Right. Yeah. And uh, so anyway, um, my father was very dark skinned, but I, I kind of was like in the middle of them. So I just assumed my whole life I was just their kid. Nobody told me otherwise. Yeah. Until I was 11 and I was getting ready to go away for this program. I'd been chosen to represent children at this camp in Denmark when I was 11 years old to promote world peace through wow. children. And my mother started drinking and she started telling me that, you know, parents have a talk with kids about all the things to watch out for when you're traveling, you know? And somehow this ended up with her telling me how much she loved me, of course. And, but um, she had been pregnant in the fifties and as a result of medicine that they had given a lot of mothers then, I always mispronounce it, flaminamide. Flaminamide, I always mispronounce it. I know I would mispronounce that. But she had a uh, miscarriage and 
uh, an emergency hysterectomy and that she never had any additional kids. So I was just crying. And it was through that, I was told that I was adopted, that they always wanted a child and they, mm -hmm. they picked me out, you know, all that. And uh, so that's how I found out. But then that caused in me a serious sense of abandonment and rejection. Like, well, I know my parents love me. Yeah. But why didn't the other people want me? Right. What is right. it about me that they didn't want? Mm -hmm. So I began an entire irrational narrative in my own mind. I knew that my biological mother was white. My biological father was black, that they were college students. I knew what my name was, what city I was from, but that's it. Mm. And so from that, I created a narrative um, that therapists, psychologists, psychiatrists will say is people often do. Um, and it was completely false, but it was to defend, protect myself about, but it caused in me as I grew, um, you know, to have a sense of abandonment and rejection, which, um, which is interesting know, because, uh, Seth, you were a real achiever too. I mean, that, you know, I guess some of that could be that when you have that feeling that you must, that, Maybe the outshoot of that is, is that you think you've got to go out and prove yourself. and, you and Prove yourself something. so people will keep you. Yeah, yeah. People won't take you back. Um, I, noticed when you, well, I noticed when you went to Penn State, uh, you were a very active in the student government. I think you were president of, of, of that body. Right. And, and uh, you know, those aren't just normal things that everybody does when they go yeah. to college, especially well, the size of somewhere like Penn State. Yeah, so... But I tell people is that I've always found myself in positions of leadership, you know, from mm -hmm. fifth grade class president, student council president in eighth grade, the yeah. quarterback of the football team in high school, uh, point guard in basketball. Yeah. Um, I guess I have almost like a, a, a sheepdog mentality. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but um, I tell people it wasn't as a result of a Napoleonic desire to conquer. It's just that every night, almost at dinner, one way or the other, my father would impress upon me that unless you're willing to be a part of the solution, mm. you forfeit your right to complain. I love that. Right. And so you've got to be a part of making things happen and solving things. And he was living that. And he was living that. My father, when he got to Penn State in 1940, he was one of just 12 black students. Mm -hmm. They were all black men. They were all varsity athletes. But because of the color of their skin, they couldn't live on campus. Mm -hmm. How incredible is that? Right. Mm -hmm. and that's And um, so after World War II, he fought in a segregated army um, that he hated, you know, yeah. the way they were disrespected. Sure. Um, he almost found in many ways he had more privilege overseas than here in America. Mm. So when he returned from combat, and he earned a Purple Heart. He was wounded in combat. When he came back from the VA hospital, he went back to Penn State. He founded the NAACP chapter and my fraternity, the Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity, which is the oldest fraternity for African-American men in America. And he led sit-ins and protests for public accommodations um, and civil rights uh, in State College, Pennsylvania. Black men wow. weren't allowed to live on campus until they had these protests, and they were allowed to live on campus in 1947. So as a result of that, whenever things happened, I just found myself, well, we've got to do something. Mm -hmm. And I found myself helping organize people. And so, yes, when I, I originally went to West Point after high school. Okay. I tell people I got a medical discharge. They found out yeah. I, was, I was allergic to math and calculus and chemistry. <laughs> I hate math. <laughs> again, that failure in life, really, I, I learned from my failures the most. Yeah, that's and it, boy, is that a heck of a tip, though? You know, right? learning and evolving from from that, absolutely. Right. So then I went to Penn State and I um, quickly got involved with the divestment movement, and I ended up leading. I got elected president of the Black Caucus to represent all the African American students. And I helped lead a, a march from Penn State to Harrisburg, which is the state capital of Pennsylvania. It was 102 miles during spring break when a lot of classmates were off Cancun or whatever, having a good time. We were walking along the highway 
to get Penn State to divest from companies that were doing business in support of the apartheid government and all of its inhumanity um, yeah. and violence in South Africa, uh, and to support some bills that were being introduced in the Harrisburg and the state capitol to have companies reinvest in Pennsylvania companies. Um, and it was successful. The conclusion was just only 35 students went on the walk. About, about you know, 100 said they would, but 35 went. And uh, at the end of it, the governor of Pennsylvania, Governor Casey, whose son is now our United States Senator, yeah. um, he, he wrote a letter in support of what we did and mentioned us by name. And uh, the board of trustees voted to divest at the next meeting. Well, that's and, something at that age, Seth, yeah. to, make, to feel like you made that type of uh, effect in a, yeah. in a college environment and then in the real world. Yeah. And then um, despite you know a lot of adverse publicity and death threats for you know, being the president of the Black Caucus and wanting the school to um, invest in, in efforts and programs so that the school could re reflect the population of the state of Pennsylvania um, and to have more African-American students and faculty. I got elected president of the entire undergraduate student government representing all 37,000 students at Penn State when I was there. Which is amazing. <laughs> right. It really is. So that was great. And, uh, you know, but again, I st always had in me this fear of rejection and abandonment. Yeah. And, you know, I never considered myself an alcoholic, but I guess everybody, all the guys on my football team, after practice, after football games, we won. We, we had a case of beer. Sure. And at Penn State, everybody, it seemed, uh, you know, binge drink, binge drank nonstop. Right. That's what college kids do, right? And then uh, I went to law school, and I had a wonderful experience at Georgetown Law School. I was uh, accepted into a program. I was a public interest law scholar, um, and I, I loved living in D.C. I loved Georgetown Law School. Um, everything I had to protest against uh, at Penn State um, didn't have to do any of that at Georgetown. It seemed it was just, yeah. and it gave me the opportunity to go to mass at lunch right there at the, the school. Sure. Um, so I really enjoyed that experience. But I wasn't sure what I wanted to do when I grew up. Um, and I had a law professor and he said, God rest his soul, he said, Seth, I was in a criminal justice clinic. So I was representing people that were indigent and accused yeah. of crime. He said, Seth, as a young black man, you should go back to Philadelphia and be a public defender because you understand the criminal mind. I was like, huh? And it was like, Archie Bunker giving Lionel Jefferson <laughs> exactly. weird. You want a, a backhand, a compliment, weird? So, yeah. But he meant well. Yeah. Um, and But I said, you know what? I learned from that experience that the person with the most discretion in the criminal justice system, other than the police officer who's actually out on the street that comes into contact with people originally, yeah. the person with the most discretion and power is the young assistant DA that's deciding whether or not to approve charges yeah. whether or not to approve a warrant, an arrest warrant or a search warrant. So I said, you know, why well, would I be an assistant district attorney so that I can help reform the broken, racist, classist, criminal justice system, while at the same time standing up for the victims of crime? Somebody's got to be the champion of the victims of crime. Mm -hmm. And so I became an assistant district attorney, and I did that for 10 and a half years prosecuting everything from low-level retail theft and possession cases. For a year, I prosecuted adults that committed crimes, sex crimes against kids. Yeah. I prosecuted, you name it, uh, homicide, shootings, kidnappings, burglaries. That's a long list. I've, I've read up on you, Seth. You had some big cases and yeah. meaningful cases throughout those 10 and a half years. How, you said you had a military background. How did yeah. that work itself so, in and weave in? So I told you, I, as a result of my um, uh, allergy to quantification skills, I <laughs> received the medical discharge from West Point. And that failure, that sense of there was something always nagging at me that I didn't complete that thing. Yeah. Um, and so after uh, getting my law license and serving the district attorney's office, I got married in 1996. And my wife, my then wife, already had a daughter. I later adopted her. 
and I wanted to remain an assistant district attorney. And I wanted to find ways to supplement and complement my income without leaving the DA's office. Yep. I began teaching as an adjunct professor at Penn State Abington. And I also, I got a direct commission in the United States Army as a JAG officer. So become a wow. lawyer in the Army. That's very and cool. Well, so I got a direct commission and I began uh, about 15 years in the Army Reserve. So one weekend a month. That's what they tell you. They tell you it's one weekend a month, but after 9-11 and a war, uh, the war on terrorism, yeah. uh, it was much more frequent than that. Absolutely. Uh, but I really appreciated the opportunity to serve. I served as a prosecutor in the army, a defense attorney. I provided legal assistance to soldiers and their dependents. I was an operations lawyer. Um, just a great experience. I transferred to the Pennsylvania Army National Guard for like the last four years I was in, three or four years. I served as the senior defense counsel for the uh, 28th Infantry Division of the Pennsylvania Army National Guard. So I was like the head public defender for an Army division. Um, so just a wonderful... Uh, uh, you know, I, that's the crazy thing about your, your reading up on you, Seth, is that you did so many different things and you were a fairly young man. I mean, the, the, the things that you did and the effect you were having in that time, um, was it always in your back of your mind that you wanted to run as a district attorney? Yes. So I, I really thought from when I was a little kid that I wanted to be the mayor. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Why not? I worked, I worked <laughs> on uh, Wilson Good's campaign when he became the first African-American mayor in the city's history. Um, and I just thought there'd be a, you know, to be able to help people and to solve problems. And, um, so that was kind of my goal. I wasn't sure what I wanted to do or how I would navigate all of this, but, you know, I just, as a result, again, of, I, I was a president of the civic association in town watch in my neighborhood. Mm -hmm. You know, and again, it wasn't as part of thinking that that is a stepping stone to emperor, but a way to serve and it evolved. I learned from that. I made connections with people sure. and found other ways to serve in my church yeah. uh, through national service in the army, um, through my legal career and providing advice and doing things. Many things, of course, are just helping individuals in anonymous ways. Um, so it was just an amazing experience. Um, I left the DA's office in 2003 after 10 and a half years because my predecessor had announced that she wasn't going to run for re-election. So in Philadelphia, you can't be an assistant DA and run for DA. So I went, I started working in private practice at a great law firm. Uh, I did personal injury and some criminal defense work. I sued what was her that like? What was that like after kind of switching, jumping on the other side of the fence of things in that time of your career? Um, well, it was for a purpose. So I knew what I was trying to do. Yeah. Um, but it was interesting just having clients. I'd experienced it while I was in law school. But, you know, people really expect if they're paying a lot of money that there's going to be no consequences to their behavior. Which, right, right. Which is, you know, so that was a, a learning experience. But just learning the business aspect also of a law practice was eye-opening. Yeah. I had one guy, a famous guy uh, at the law firm named Ted Scher, and his quote was, it ain't about the money. It's about the money. <laughs> <laughs> so, it was funny, but I understood what he meant, you know. Um, but I, uh, you know, left the DA's office and I began the process of creating a political action committee, making all the network that was necessary. Um, I ran against the incumbent. I only raised $150,000. She raised and spent over a million and called oh me everything, everything but the son of God. But I, I got 46% of the vote. I almost beat her. Yeah. I'm running on. How old know, would you have been at that time, Seth, when you did that? You had to be a young man. I was 40. 40 years old. Yeah. Right. I was 40, I think. Um, I have to check. But I got elected. I was 38, I think, then, actually. Okay. I was 38. 
but I won when I was 42. So when I ran again four years later. She didn't run. It was a, a very crowded uh, field in the primary of five candidates. And I won. And then I won in November with 75% of the vote. And I became the first African-American district attorney in the history, not only of the city of Philadelphia, but the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. What do you think about that? What was going through your mind when in 75% of the vote in, a, in an election like that where... I want to know who were the other 25%. <laughs> what were so, they thinking? What were they thinking? <laughs> and uh, so I began, you know, um, it's an office of 600 employees um, and annual budget uh, exceeding $55 million. Um, and so... You know, I was, I tell people I was always, I think I was prepared strategically and yeah. operationally to be yeah. the DA. From my military experience, all the leadership things in the community and the church, I was in charge of the church carnival committee, the, the parish pastoral council, all those things. Um, I wasn't prepared uh, emotionally, I don't okay. think, okay. Um, for the responsibility of being the DA. Uh, and by that, I mean, um, I'm a person maybe as a result of the adoption and I'm a people pleaser. Yeah. And I want to I don't want to upset people. Um, so it's good to have a number two, you know, your first assistant or someone in the chain of command that is that harsh right. no person. Um, but. You know, so that coupled with as a, a, a political candidate where you have to be a part of a partisan elective process, mm -hmm. you have to raise money. And by raising money, you know, to raise um, $100,000, let's say, right? You can either talk to, a, you know, a thousand people that give you a hundred bucks or you can call just a couple people that can give you a lot of money. So yeah. you start spending more time. I had to spend every Monday, half of every Monday, just raising money, having fundraisers. And then raising money, I just can't call you one day and say, hey, can you give me $2,500? I have to call you on your birthday in February. I've got to see how, you know, you invite me to your house. I got to go and go to your kid's bar mitzvah or bat mitzvah or baptism or whatever. <laughs> So I began really thinking a lot of these people were my friends. Sure. Or maybe they weren't, maybe they were, maybe they had ulterior motive. Yeah, and you so get in a position funny. like that, you, you, you don't know for sure. I you mean, don't know. How can you, All right? And with my predisposition to wanting friends and wanting approval, it was not the best uh, combination at the time. And I didn't, despite what I thought I was doing for my own mindfulness and it wasn't enough. And you couple that with the stress of being a, a politician in a city that is known for its just dirty cutthroat politics. Yeah. Having a staff of 600 people who at the time, since I had left in 2003 and came back in 2010, many of the employees were my former colleagues. Sure. Who good or bad had issues and then you take into it the responsibility of deciding which cases we're going to ask for the death penalty mm -hmm. right the reforms that we have to make dealing with the press dealing with you know cases that they've made documentaries and movies about like kermit gosnell who was running a not only an illegal pill mill but an illegal abortion clinic mm -hmm. um you know, I was the first district attorney in American history to prosecute the hierarchy of the Catholic Church for shielding pedophile priests. I read that. Yeah. Um, which, you know, it's no coincidence that and you're led Catholic. to Catholic. And I was Catholic, correct. And that led to, and no coincidence, seven of the charges that were brought against me were related to the Archdiocese of Philadelphia. Mm. Right. So as a result of that, um, I and my father passed away in 2001. He was my best friend. So he didn't I get really to see didn't, the election then. He didn't get to see the election. 
Yeah. I didn't really have a person to be able to talk to. I was the only yeah. child. I didn't know yeah. who to trust. Yeah. And so unfortunately, I began gradually to trust this guy named Jack Daniels a little more and a guy named Martini <laughs> who uh, had a friend named Extra Driver Muth. <laughs> and um, so I began to numb myself from a lot of the stress. Yeah, it was like your escape. That. And um, I tried, I thought, you know, I, I had a daily cigar, which I thought was, you know, um, both of my grandfathers smoked. It was my way of kind of like decompressing. Sure. And, um, but there were healthier ways to deal with stress and the anxieties and the things that I was dealing with. But all of those things. Was your, what, at that time, Seth, was your wife, kids, everything good at home? Or were they thinking you were under a lot of stress and you were, you know, uh, out in the world of trying to conquer and, but, but, but stressed in the, in the real yeah. sense? Well, I mean, I tried to do what I thought was, I was always, I went to, you know, every class trip, uh, you know, all the parenting game. things. I was a coach of daughter's softball team, the seventh and eighth grade girls basketball team. Yeah. T-ball, all those, things are, you know, yeah. so I tried as much as possible. Um, I'm sure if you were to talk to them, of course, there were things that I could have done much better, which I recognize. And, um, you know, um, I think my ex-wife would have said that I was concerned about doing the gardening outside in the backyard. She yeah. was more concerned about the inside of the house. Well, mm -hmm. She thinks it's a metaphor of what I was concerned with the exterior things and not as much the family. There might be some That's merit to that. I thought more, I like doing gardening. Sure. I like cutting the grass and I found that therapeutic, Yeah. you know? Um, so, um, but, you know, so as being the DA, I, I started to um, deal with that stress and began making many enemies prosecuting people, getting into conflict with the attorney general over a, a significant issue, prosecuting the church. The Archbishop of Philadelphia, Chapu, and I were in a, a public battle. Mm -hmm. And he even told my pastor not to give me communion and not for wow. a theological reason, but just, you know, out of his own personal uh, issue. Um, and so all of that began to skyrocket. And when you combine the enemies that I had made with the unforced errors of, you know, I got divorced. I was trying to maintain my lifestyle of keeping the house that my children and I lived in, um, keeping them in private school, the same private school that I went to, right? Yeah. Uh, either as a result of Catholic guilt or narcissism. I wanted to have my kids go to the same school I went to. Sure, I get live it. Live in a great house. Do all the things that I, my parents sacrificed for me. Yeah. And so I was living beyond my means, um, but like just paycheck to paycheck. Yeah. Um, and I had, as a result of my position and life, I had a lot of friends that were extremely wealthy. Mm -hmm. Who would say, hey, Seth, take your kids down to my house down the shore. Mm -hmm. Or, hey, we're going to San Diego to our house for the week. You want to go? I'm like, I can't afford that. Oh, we got points in a black card. They're going to yeah. expire in October and they're going to go poof. So come on with us. We're going to stay at our house. I'm like, yeah. okay. So I should have reported all of those gifts. And as a result of my own hubris, arrogance, laziness, neglect, all of those things I didn't. Um, and well, let me ask you something, Seth, because I think a lot of people get because it's, you know, it's something you find in the news quite a bit, too. It's it's uh, I don't think people are really familiar with how that works. If I give you gifts and you report those gifts, disclose those gifts, then does it matter how many gifts do you get? Well, every jurisdiction and, and locale is different. Okay. But in Philadelphia, no, I could get there's unlimited gifts I could have received. You just had to disclose it. But I just had to disclose them so yeah. that then the public for transparency 
to make if, a decision. Right. If if the if Spectre, remember Spectre, that was the group that um, the organized crime group that James Bond was always after, <laughs> yeah, right? right, right. Okay. <laughs> Goldfinger and all those guys. Yeah. If Spectre was giving District Attorney Williams a lot of hundred thousand dollars, kind of a it'd big be, deal. It'd be helpful for the public to know. Sure. That the drug cartel or Spectre or you know, Brent Cassidy is giving Seth Williams money yeah. so that the public can then make the decision eh, or it's oh. OK or whatever the reason is. Um, and so then I went and I negotiated with the city. I um, how did it come up, though, Seth? I mean, how does something like that come up? How, how do how do you how do. How does the office or the government entity know that you haven't disclosed? Is it a secret investigation? Did you know an investigation was going on? Like, how did well, the nightmare start? You know, I had been the inspector general, so I knew what was necessary. And so Inside I should have afforded all my yeah. gifts. Um, but every year I would just put, I would put just no gifts. Because I thought, well, like the, the most, if I, I would thought in my mind incorrectly. So mm -hmm. I'm not denying that. Right. If the defense attorney that had cases before me was giving gifts to the DA, I said that should have been something I should have reported. But that right. never happened. So I right. thought the gift from my 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 daughter's classmate of going to their house down the shore, mm -hmm. or my daughter babysat somebody and they're like, let's go to San Diego, mm -hmm. or my then girlfriend gave me a used Rolex watch. Mm -hmm. or whatever everything had to be disclosed i should Regardless. write anything more than 50 dollars yeah. from a a um um other than a sibling a parent or a spouse or a child needed to be reported so i should have done that um but there was no quid pro quo nobody got anything from me um yeah. but you know that was a dispute between me and the federal government but uh, the dispute was as a result of people that I that were enemies of mine, people that sure. had a beef, either uh, employees that were disciplined, um, the, the the Catholic Church, um, my predecessor. Um, yeah. you know, I had yeah, all these enemies. enemies. Sure. And as re just you know, I had to um, fire an employee uh, for something that she did, and uh, so then of course she has to go and try to spin something to the, the the attorney general the fbi uh, one employee we had to separate we had to discipline him because he had sexually assaulted there was an allegation of sexual assault um and we disciplined him um and he said that if he didn't get the specific job he had back that he was going to drop dime on me mm -hmm. um and so this, this domino began um, and originally the FBI was investigating me for what they had been told was having ghost employees. They quickly found that that was not true. Um, but that once they, you know, there was a great book that we spoke about called yeah. Three Felonies a Day. Yeah. Um, what's the author's name? Oh, man. Silverman, yeah. Silvergraf or... Something but, like that. I, I'll put that. Uh, I'll put that in the show notes too, because it's a good right. Book. But you know, the lesson is that um, if the federal authorities want to prosecute anyone, mm -hmm. um, they have the resources and the ability to take something before a grand jury, where you might not have had any criminal intent, no, no mens rea for crime, but something did happen. Yeah. Um, and they can get almost anyone indicted because you don't have a defense before a grand jury. Which it's most just, people, you and I talked about this Seth, the other day, most people don't know that. When you hear a correct. grand jury, you assume that both sides are represented. Correct. Um, and so, you know, I was indicted for about seven charges for driving my city vehicle for personal use which I knew as the, the inspector general, it's different. It's not, I wasn't like a water department employee that took a water truck to go take yeah, the kids wherever. to the mall. Yeah. I had a vehicle, a Chevy Tahoe, 
that was outfitted with lights and sirens. Um, and I had 24 hour police protection and two officers went with me everywhere I went. Well, there was a big story about us having spent so much money on overtime for the security detail. And I just also just for the sake of sheer uh, speed, if my daughters at the last minute remember they left their lacrosse stick at school, instead of me having to call and have the security guys come get me and take me, I would just take the vehicle myself because they had some sirens and I could get on the radio and call if there's a problem. Mm -hmm. I thought I was solving, an, uh, I was being a good fiduciary, a uh, good financial steward. Right. Um, and then they were able to tell the grand jury that I should have used security or times I shouldn't have used security. And I got indicted for that under wire fraud because my secretary emailed my schedule to my staff. <laughs> wow. That was your um, wire. So, and with the, actually, actually, that ended up being your charge, wasn't it? Wire fraud? Um, well, those were some of the charges, but I ended up, as you mentioned, I went on trial. Yeah. Because I negotiated, you know, I should have made, I should have reported my gifts and I didn't. I negotiated with the city what I thought was a more than fair penalty and settlement for that. Yeah. Um, uh, the feds had said that they were going to pull back if I did that or if I announced I wasn't running for re-election, all which I did. But then um, after o President Obama left office and before President Trump was appointing the new uh, U.S. attorney there, in that vacuum, I was indicted. And um, so, yeah, so that's what happened. But I went on trial. And during the second week, we were given an offer to plead guilty to one count. And I ended up pleading guilty to one count of a violation of the Travel Act. So a friend took me on a trip and they said as a result of him taking me on the trip, it was part of his idea to befriend me um, so that I could help him out. But you you got you got a big sentence. I mean, that the overall sentence that you know you you, you went to trial. You uh, and like you said, you had some good days and then a bad day and some. But you, in your plea, and one of the things you told me, which I thought was interesting, was is that you were going through this, and in your mind, your attorney says, "Well, you can choose to, you know, if they get you on one of these counts, you could see your daughters on there." out of high school, or you can see them later in there after they get out of college and beyond. And, right. you know, that's a, that's a lot for a dad to think about too, is yeah, you, so that was a lot of stress of your life and, and your, your world that how does it all evolve from this point, right at this moment in this courtroom. And so as a young prosecutor, I didn't think anyone would ever plead guilty unless they were guilty. Right. Um, and you know, in federal, in the federal system, about 97% of all uh, people that are indicted, indicted plead. Uh, plead. Mm -hmm. And I can assure you that not all 97% of the people that are charged are guilty. Right. I was in prison with people that had been, their wives were the subjects of investigations. And then as a result of that, to put pressure on the wife, they charged the husband with something. Yep. You know, That's or... Um, you know, I thought as a young prosecutor, what I was doing, prosecuting people who every day in Philadelphia, cars are being stolen, mm -hmm. fires are being started, people are being raped, homes are being burglarized, mm -hmm. right? people are being shot, people are being murdered. Um, most federal crimes is just something that someone's decided we're going to go after this thing. Yeah. Right. Well, uh, you're right. Because most of both, most violent crimes, unless they've gotten over state borders, they're 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 contained within the state. Correct. That's why you and see so, there's so many drug dealers in the federal system, because by the nature of their business, it's it crosses the state line. Or that's what I thought before I went to federal prison. Yeah. But the majority of the men that were in prison with me um, were there for selling drugs. Yeah. Um, and those that were there, the majority of them were there on ghost drug cases. Absolutely. Absolutely. Which I never heard of until I went to prison. In state yeah. court, 
if I'm going to be the DA proving that Brent sold drugs, I have to put on a witness that saw him make some sort of hand-to-hand transaction or delivery of something. Exactly. To show that he received some sort of compensation or something for that. And we have to recover the drugs that we think he transferred and test them and show that, in fact, they were a controlled substance. Right. We have to do all of that beyond a reasonable doubt. Every part of that 360-degree circle of evidence in federal court, for the most part, the drug dealers they prosecute are people that beat a lot of lower cases in the state court. Mm-hmm. And they will indict them based on a telephone conversation or, or someone else that said, well, here's a conversation between Brent and Seth. Hey, Brent, how you doing? Yeah, I'm good. Yeah, I'm thinking about getting some, some poodles. I don't know, maybe a Rottweiler, maybe some Huskies. You got Huskies? Yeah, 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 I got lots of Huskies. I'm really, that's all I'm doing now are Huskies. So how much are you selling Huskies for? About a thousand a piece. Okay, well, let's, let's talk about it some more. Meet me down at the wharf tomorrow at noon and uh, you know, maybe I'll get some Huskies from you. So with that, basically, they go to a grand jury and they say, this is Seth asking Brent for kilos of heroin, right. which go for a value of X. And due to the amount that he was going to buy, it means this. And then they get the grand jury with the expert testimony of this person from the DEA to, con- to indict me for the sale of narcotics, even though no narcotics were ever recovered. Maybe it was Seth just selling wolf tickets, just talking big. Maybe they were going to be a drug deal. I don't know. Right? A lot of ambiguity there. A lot of ambiguity. And that the majority of guys in federal prison for this. I want to talk about this, Seth, because you are definitely the first person I've ever had on this show that was, that had the career that you had and walked into a federal prison. What, can you walk us through that? How was it? What, what was that? How, what was going through your mind? Well, I didn't have time to prepare for it because on the evening of June the 28th, I decided at the result of my uh, attorney's advocacy that I should accept this offer. I told my daughters that night. I told the ex, you know, the girlfriend, I told the ex-wife all, you know, um, and I had been told that I'd be able to remain on bail. Sure. You know, until you the second that would be the case. I'm sure you're, how long did you have while this case was going on? The investigation up to the point where you're thinking I'm going to plea. A couple of years. Yeah. Exactly. Right. And I got indicted in March and this is now June. I'm not a flight risk. Right. H- hadn't gone anywhere. Hadn't gone anywhere. And I thought that I'd have the whole summer to, get my affairs in order, as we say, yeah. um, take, get, sell the house, box up my belongings, take my daughters to therapy, mm-hmm. have time just to hang out with them before I went away. Yeah. I went to court. I entered the plea. Uh, much to my uh, surprise, the judge decided to revoke my bail immediately. And I was handcuffed in court, taken underground, strip searched, given an orange jumpsuit, and placed in solitary confinement for five months. What's going on in your mind on that moment? My head was just swimming with, I just couldn't imagine Mm -hmm. what was going on. How did this happen to me? And, but again, if it hadn't been for going to West Point on the 1st of July of 1985 for our day, reception day, and going through boot camp Mm -hmm. in the army at West Point, and being a soldier for all those years, um, you know, that really prepared me for that day. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, I tell people all the things that I lost. Reputation, salary, savings, law license, pension, liberty, time with loved ones. Is when I lost everything. But I learned that when God was all I had. God was all I needed. And that's, that's what got me through 
the worst nightmare of my life was just, you know, a friend told me, uh, Brian Lentz, who had also served in the army and he was my campaign manager when I first ran. Look, don't try to figure out how you're going to get through 60 months of this, right? He said, how do you eat an elephant? Mm -hmm. Piece at a time. Just one, one small bite at a time. Mm -hmm. So I began reading every type of book you can imagine. And I came across a book called uh, Born Again by Chuck oh. Colson. Okay. So he had served as a special advisor and counsel to President Richard Milhouse Nixon. And as a result of his own investigation, he got indicted and he found himself in federal prison. And uh, there's a great passage that I always think about. I think it's on page 306. Oh, right. Hold on. Yep. And when I read this, because my friend Brian Lentz sent this to me while I was in solitary. Mm -hmm. Um, and like, despite, you know, my differences with the disagreement I had on my culpability or mens rea with the charges the feds brought against me, yeah. the words that Chuck Colson said were so true. He said, I was in prison because I had to be there. An essential step, a price I had to pay to complete the shedding of my old life and to be free to live the new. Mm, that's deep. He, he was preparing me, chastening me for the future, perhaps. But for what purpose now? So when I read that, I get chills thinking about that. Yeah. I, I, I never would have chosen to be there in prison. It was not a part of my life plan. Like I planned everything. Yes. I thought I was making a plan. But right, we make plans and God laughs. And I was where God wanted me to be. A guy in solitary one day told me that he didn't commit suicide because of me. Mm. Wow. He, he, I didn't know him. I was one hour a day, I got what's called rec, where they would mm -hmm. take me to my own like SPCA cyclone fence gated you know, size of a parking space area that still had a covered roof, but, you know, chain link fence all around me. And uh, he said, Mr. Williams, may I speak to you? I was like, sure. He had a thick Nigerian accent. And he began telling me how he was, he had an MBA from Brooklyn University. He had a finance degree. He was in real estate. He was the son of a Nigerian diplomat. He had never been in trouble in his life. He had five kids and a, a wife, but he had been part of some sort of real estate transaction in New York City. All of the other people went to lawyers first. He ended up getting, he was the guy holding the hot potato. He got prosecuted. He found, he turned himself in. He's in the detention center awaiting his plea. And some kid wanted to use a toilet in his cell, started a fight. He had a big bandage over his head. Mm. And he's telling me this story. And he said that he then found himself in solitary confinement as a result of that fight. And it was bad enough that he thought he had disgraced his whole family and brought shame upon them. But now being in solitary confinement for a week, it was just too much for him. And he just said he decided to take his own life. He hit rock bottom. He had hit rock bottom. And he said at that moment, he'd written his family his letter. And he put in the envelope. But before the correctional officers could take the envelope, he saw them walking me through the hall. And they always, you know, those correctional officers had their arms on my shoulders. I'm handcuffed behind my back, walking through the hall. Like I'm Lex Luthor or Hannibal Lecter. Right. 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 He murdered several people, right. Right. And uh, he said, that is Mr. Williams. He has mu lost much more than I shall ever have. Yet he is still standing. If he can survive, so shall I. I was like, wait a minute. 
you got an orange jumpsuit just like you. Yeah. I said, I don't know what you're talking about. He said, no, because you help other people. You haven't given up hope. You are respectful. You're humble. Because of you, my five children still have a father. My wife still has a husband. It had to affect you in a powerful way. If I'm saying then that. I began to see my life in a different perspective. It wasn't through the lens. Everybody was telling me to read the book of Job in the Bible. Job lost everything. But, mm -hmm. you know, the punchline of Job is, you know, don't worry about why things happen to you. Always give honor and glory to God. It's, it's his show, not yours. Mm -hmm. He's doing what he needs for his purpose. Okay. But then as a result of bright agato his name literally means light of god okay as a result of him telling me all this i began to see myself through the perspective of a different character in the old testament named joseph in genesis who was the favored child of his father his brothers were jealous they tried to throw him in a pit then they sold him off to slavery remember joseph had a real pretty coat right his brothers were jealous and they thought he was a favored son he got sold into slavery. He became the best slave. And Potiphar's wife said, hey, you're sexy. You're 17, basically. I want, to, I, want to, I want you. He was like, no, I can't do that. That'd be an abomination against your husband who put me in charge of everything here and an abomination against God. So then she claimed that he raped her. So he was falsely accused and went to prison, became the best inmate. And then eventually Pharaoh pulled him out of the prison and made him the number two guy in all of Egypt. And he came up with the, the process of rotating the crops. And, you know, Egypt became an economic superpower in the Middle East, the world as they knew it. And the punchline of that story in Genesis 50, 20, is that what others intended for my harm, God has used for good and the saving of many lives. So I began saying it, you know what? I don't know what the purpose of all this is, but all these things I've gone through have led up to this and have prepared me for this. Yeah. And I became a G. I remember I, used to t I told you at the beginning. Well, yeah, because I, I, I wanted to jump into that whole thing with how you, what were your, what was your, because I, you know, you five months in, in, in that solitary confinement is a lot of time. I was with a guy that was, I was really close to at Leavenworth, Rick Gregg, who did 16 months in, in a county jail. How did you, what was the strategy in your mind going into prison? How did you live in that unknown world walking through after going through five months of solitary, finally getting to your destination, Seth, what, where were you as far as your thinking and how you were going to live your life in there? Everything is based on um, just trying to get through today Yep. and preparing yourself for when you get home. Yep. And a lot of guys don't do that. A lot of guys just live for today. And that's why they get so scared about returning home. Right. And I thought, well, what can I do to use my gifts now mm -hmm. to help people? How can I reimagine myself today and as I move forward and to be open to learn from everyone. Right. But how did I get through daily? A lot of it is by making lists. I recorded everything. I'd write down everything. Every book I read, every letter I wrote, everybody that wrote me a letter, I had numbered it. I kept track of things. I had to try to do things to keep my mind engaged. Yep. I would create, you know, those word um, search games. You have for yeah. kids when they're like, I would make those. You know, I would make all types of things. I would make tic tac toe games and send them to my kids. Here's my ex, and they'd send back. I learned how to play the saxophone. I learned how to play the piano. I became the beginner instructor of both of those in Morgantown. I, I went to every Catholic mass, every Catholic catechism, Protestant worship service. Protestant Bible study, you name it. I was just trying to soak it all up. I taught GED. Uh, 19 of my students earned their GED. 
I that make you, how, did that, how did that make you feel in there, in prison, getting these guys into a GED world of I always talk about accomplishment? The, the greatest recidivism reduction program is an education. Yep. I had talked about my father doing more to prevent crime doing that. than me. Yeah. I found myself actually doing it and living it. Yeah. Isn't that something? And so it was just a... Uh, as bizarre as it sounds, it's a very rewarding experience. I taught classical poetry. I taught a uh, workforce development and I taught spin class also, you know, where you ride the bicycle. Yeah. I taught spin class and I started lifting weights every morning with really young kids. Yeah. And um, so it was just a way of survival, just trying to adapt Right. Well, that's, that's something you and I talked about, Seth, that I think is, is um, you know, you talked to, you, I mean, you named off all the different things that you lost and, you know, hitting that rock bottom point where, you know, you have to decide whether I'm going to live or I'm going to die, basically. Right. And you have that also moment where you say, my world has become a bunk bed, a locker and a plastic chair. And from that moment, we, you know, like you and I were talking, that's somewhat liberating because you find in that moment, I can't believe I got here. I can't believe I'm here, but I can survive it. I can, I can adapt to it. And there's something right. about that moment that fills you up with something that you didn't know you had, or you hadn't reached that deep to know that you needed it, but it is something. Right. And to your point, exactly about this nightmare occurring, right? Well, you know, I used to have, I told you I used to love gardening, right? So I had a great riding tractor. I got every type of weed whacker, this, that, and the other. I used to, I used to love grilling. I love grilling. Yeah, I love At one point grill. in my life though, I had five grills. <laughs> you told me that. Right, I, I don't propane, know anybody got five grills. The propane, I got the charcoal, I got a smoker, I got this and that. Well, for, 34 months, all I had was a locker that was connected to the wall yeah. that was three feet tall, two feet wide, and one foot deep. And everything I needed was in there. It was right there, yeah. So all these things chasing, I need this thing, you know? Like, I don't carry a watch now. It's not that I... I I like the Rolex watch I used to have. Sure. It had meaning because it was, you know, similar to the one that my father had. So it, it had meaning to me, but just looking on the phone tells me the time. Yeah, I, I would, I'd hate to be in the watch business now with everybody carrying around a phone that tells them what time it is. Yeah. So, you know, all of these things that I thought I had to have, I didn't need them. Yeah. And I was, you know, a, a false, a false world I created about stuff that I needed and stuff that the why. Well, let me ask you this, Seth, because you, you did all these things while you were in there. You were helping people. You were seeing accomplishments. It was filling you up. Right. As you're getting closer to the door to freedom. And you went through a program, the nine, same nine month program I went through uh, that was you know, you, it was a real program that uh, called RDAP that you you have to adhere to, and and it's it's uh, you you live in a certain place and you do certain things, and mm -hmm. thinking about getting out, what were you thinking as far as here's Seth Williams before accomplished, did all these list of things, gone into prison, I've kind of reestablished myself and my my strength of being able to help people and do things. What were you thinking about when you were getting out? What was, what was your thought process of how, how is life going to project me out of here? In many ways, coming home and trying to get started again mm -hmm. is more difficult than actually being away. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I thought more of the people that I had helped, that I had done things for, 
or people that would recognize, here's a guy who was an assistant DA, a civil attorney, criminal defense attorney, army lawyer and officer, elected DA, I would think more people would come seeking me for my perspective and advice on crime right. prevention, public safety. Yeah. That wasn't the case. You know, so I thought, well, what can I do? And I really found that I found great joy and value and reward in what I learned teaching GED that the majority of the men that I taught never had problems getting legitimate jobs. You know, they were, they were supplementing their income with things that brought them into conflict with the government. Sure. But they never had problems getting jobs. They had problems keeping jobs. So it's my go it was my goal. I said, well, if nothing else, you know, and, and I've created, I have my own LLC, Second Chance Strategies, and I advise um, and I contract with nonprofits or businesses to create vocational training and workforce development programs to create a direct pipeline from uh, returning citizens to careers. Love it. I, I told you the other day, I, I think it is so powerful for so many reasons, Seth, because I, I'm lucky to be in this chair and get to interview people like you week after week. And I, when I hear of something where somebody has gone through what you've gone through and you realize that they didn't take your brain, they didn't right. take your drive, and whatever that grit is that made you who you were as a kid and through college and, and, and get through what you got through – to then give that journey into your overall experience and help people, man, that's got to feel good. Yeah. And it's still very challenging. Yeah. But just very recently, things have changed much for the better. Um, but I will be uh, creating another vocational training program that not only provides the technical training, but also provides the life skills, the workforce development, the, the people skills. I refer to them as the power skills. People often refer to them as the soft skills. Yeah. But about, you know, Stanford uh, did a study and 85% of the skills that you need in the workplace aren't the technical skills about how to make the widget. They're to show up on time, how yeah. to deal with conflict, right? Sure. All those things. Um, and so, I'll be doing that. Also, um, having a, a resource specialist, uh, like a social worker that's mm -hmm. there that helps people navigate and remove the barriers that they have to employment and to housing, getting government documents. You know, when yeah. you come home, you have to have a house, you have yeah. to have a job, mm -hmm. you've got to get your social security card, you've got to get your birth certificate. But nobody helps you do any of those things. No, and I and I always say to people on this show is that, that we're the last of our breed. The ex felon is the last of their breed that can be legally discriminated against. You got to check the box that you have this for your job, and and they won't rent to you a lot of times if you right. have. So it, it's legal, and you you have to help people get through that, or right. they do fall back into that recidivism of the seventy five percent. The first apartment I applied for when I got home, I got denied. Yep. After all this, you know, it happened in your life. You know? <laughs> you know, it's, and I, I want to ask you, Seth, too, because I, having somebody like you on the show, considering what all is going on in, in, in our society and in, in the United States right now with our system, uh, you know, the, the criminal justice system and, and what we're seeing, it's in the news every week, every day, you know, both political parties, everybody's out there, you know, talking. What do you think? What do you think of it all? And what do you, what, what are the ways that it could be better? Well, we're being sold a, a false narrative and given a false choice by some extreme left wing people that we have to only focus on reforming the system. Right. 
So the pendulum swings back and forth in criminal justice from law and order to tough on crime, right, to just being soft on crime or easy. Right? It goes back and forth. Oh, yeah. You can watch through the decades how it changes back and forth and swings. Yeah. Right. And a friend of mine who used to be the district attorney of San Francisco, then she became the attorney general of California and a United States senator who happens to be now the vice president of the United States, Kamala Harris, mm -hmm. wrote a great book called Smart on Crime. And I really think the answer isn't being soft or hard on crime. It'd be smart on crime. We have to address the root causes. But you have this, these extreme left-wing um, people that are uh, winning offices and district attorney's offices and whatnot across the country who have made a false choice. Um, it's not reform the criminal justice system or provide public safety. Yeah. We have to do both. Right, smart. They, they have to be done simultaneously mm -hmm. and well. The public wants to be safe. We want fewer people to shoot each other. Right. Right. But some of these, like in Philadelphia, the DA got rid of all these programs that I had created. Right. But he thinks that they were overly, you know, yeah, the prisons were, there's a disproportionate number of people in prison for shooting people in Philadelphia that are black and brown men. That's a reality. It's very sad. The, the truth is also that 80% of the men shooting each other in Philadelphia are black and brown men shooting each other. Right. That's a reality as well. So we have to do all that we can to prevent them from shooting each other. We also have to hold them accountable for behavior. Um, and again, it's not the severity of punishment that changes behavior. It's the certainty of accountability. Oh, I like that. Yeah. 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 Uh, accountability and, and, you know, a, and, and it's one of the things too, that I think is important is, is that um, people coming out of prison are not prison creatures. They should not all be taken in one gigantic barrel and, and, and treated exactly the same. There's some people that are desperately trying for a second chance to make things work for themselves. And they hopefully can find their way through and have, you know, you need support, you know, when you get out, you need right. people, you need mentors like you're talking about, Seth, that can help you to the next step. You know, there and there's people that will apply themselves if given that opportunity. And, and you know, hopefully that's that's something that happens as as, as we get along here is, is that uh, as society learns a little bit more about what's going on in this world, um, all these people that go and experience the criminal justice system, uh, there's quite a few of them that got some talent out here that can be helpful to society as a whole and, and, and at least be given the opportunity to do that. Yeah. Seth, let me ask you something. I ask everybody this, but for you, I, I think you know, it's just an interesting thing to look at just from everything that's happened in your life. What do you think is your greatest takeaway from your journey that you've been through? That, uh, all things happen for the good of God. And that it's all because of him and for him and through him. And that, um, you know, I just have a role to play for him. And it's not about what I think is best. <laughs> you know? um, so my, that was my greatest takeaway is just, yeah. you know, a, a, an incredibly, um, an incredible spiritual journey and, you know, so that was a major part. I also learned that people that I otherwise would not have met or would not have thought to, I mean, I thought I was brought up in a great way and I could learn from everybody, but being in prison really forced me that some of the, the, the wisest men yeah. had no education. Yeah. And I learned so much from them. And you found more people are respectful in prison um, yeah. than anywhere it's else. Not respect. It's a society oh, respect. The society based on a hierarchy. Feminine. Yeah. Of respect. Um, from where you sit when you're watching TV to yep. getting in line for, for, for lunch to everything is about, you know, this hierarchy and respect. Um, and I learned a lot from that. I also learned that. Uh, you don't know what you can survive yeah. until you're forced to survive the worst. Yeah, so true. 
And so just from a pure uh, resilience, you know, Somewhat liberating, right? Yeah. The girlfriend was, will say to me, you know, is it too hot in here? Let me turn the air conditioning. I don't know. <laughs> Whatever. 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 Yeah, I'm fine. I mean, I, you know, I almost don't have a, a, a warning in me anymore when something's too hot or too cold or I'm uncomfortable. Just, I'm just it good. is what it is. <laughs> I'll just, deal with I know. it. I'll deal with it. But, yeah, much better than prison. Seth Williams, man, I so much appreciate you coming on today. If anybody out there uh, got something out of this, man, share this show. Share <laughs> this show. Share it to everybody you know. Um, it, it helps grow the show. Uh, if you've got time, I know it's a hassle, but, boy, if you could go to Spotify, go to Apple, leave a review. It's pretty simple. You don't have to say much, but it puts the, the uh, show on steroids. Uh, go to BrentCassie.com if you want to leave me a message or just check out what's going on in me with me uh, and uh, leave me a message there. I'll go back and forth with you on anything you want to talk about. Uh, if you're looking for a book, I wrote one, Nightmare Success. Check it out on uh, Amazon, uh, Barnes & Noble. They're even selling it in Walmart. Um, as I used to say to um, my people when I was typing emails back and forth, in Leavenworth, stay strong and I'll do the same. Seth Williams, thanks so much for being here today. Appreciate the story. Thank you very much. I'll gladly come back on whenever you want. And Brent, just if any of your uh, listeners want to get in touch with me, they can email me for uh, uh, hope and for, you know, just an ear, if that's what they need, um, at Seth at secondchancestrategies.net. And I will put that in the show notes because people reach out to Seth. He's got a story and he can help. Anything that's going on, if you're stuck, this is the man you might want to talk to. Yeah. And I success. promise I'm going to, I'm going to read your book. <laughs> I appreciate that, Zach. Yes, sir. Always good to have another reader on my book. All right, folks. I'm Mr. Seth. Send it out. Uh, talk to you all later. Bye.